everybody, I'm Tim Mooney with the Timothy Mooney Repertory Theater. So today, I'm continuing with yet another of our series on Shakespeare's histories. On my way to explore all ten history plays, this time we're halfway through with Henry V. I perform portions of Henry V as part of my one-man play, Shakespeare's Histories, Ten Epic Plays at a Breakneck Pace, which is available for bookings either live, in person, or online. This month, I'm performing it as part of the Indianapolis Fringe Festival. I've also got a brand new studio version available to broadcast to your school or organization at a significant discount. You save a lot when I don't have to spend on gas or hotel. My plan here is to shine just a little more light into what may seem like a very tangled rhetorical web and perhaps give you a sense of just what Shakespeare might have wanted his audience to get out of that. So here's I Finally Get Henry V. So Shakespeare finally writes the play that perhaps everyone has been waiting for. In the history of England, there have been, up until the 1590s, when Shakespeare wrote the histories, perhaps only two outright victories that were universally celebrated. One of those two triumphs was still in the near rearview mirror, the English victory over the Spanish Armada in 1588, a victory so complete that the English saw it as an active endorsement from God for their Protestant cause. Every bit as decisive was the great victory, some 180 years prior, of Henry V over the French at Agincourt on St. Crispin's Day in 1415. This great victory fixed Henry V as a hero for centuries to follow. One suspects that Shakespeare may have been intimidated to find the human being within the lionized King Henry, and indeed he gave himself two plays to warm up to him, elaborating on his backstory as the rascal Prince Hal through Henry IV Parts I and II, carousing with the fat, thieving knight Sir John Falstaff, but eventually stepping up to assume his rightful place as king. More on those plays here. And yet one senses that Shakespeare himself has great ambivalence about war and about the near deification of a hero king. He seems to struggle to present us with a depiction of the King Henry his audience wants to celebrate, revealing instead a human being far more complicated and contradictory than he is in the usual English propaganda. Shakespeare has some wonderful, soaring, heroic speeches from or about King Henry that will stir your blood and inspire you to dive into battle. You know those speeches already, more or less. Oh, for a muse of fire! Once more into the breach, dear friends! We few, we happy few, we band of brothers! Those are the ones you have heard and more or less already know. And when I perform Shakespeare's histories, those are the speeches that I include as part of the show. This explainer is not about those speeches. This is about the ones you don't know, that Shakespeare sneaks in when you aren't paying attention. Not the ones that make your heart sing with patriotism, the ones that make you question whether patriotism is all that great of a thing. In fact, even in the opening prologue, oh, for a muse of fire, Shakespeare starts to hint at this, suggesting that famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment beside the great King Henry. Not prosperity or joy or human kindness, but famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. It's still a great speech, but I'll bet that this is the first time you notice that Shakespeare used those particular words to describe Henry. Early on in the play, after some internal English debate of the rightfulness of his intent to declare himself King of France, King Henry makes the decisive choice to take his forces to France and sends an ambassador, the Duke of Exeter, to threaten the French king to relinquish the crown. And here we get a sense of Shakespeare's attitude toward war. Exeter demands that they take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. And on your head, turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the pining maiden's groans for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is not our traditional hero's journey material. Most heroic tales of battle tend not to indulge in mentions of widows and orphans, much less depict the blood and the groans that ensue. 
Henry proceeds in his attack and lays siege to the town of Harfleur, which holds Henry off from within their fortress walls. Yes, this scene does open up with, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. But that speech doesn't win the war or even the battle. Henry's men are tired, diseased, and many of them have died when he calls for the governor of the town to surrender. And Shakespeare has Henry going far beyond the typical parlay into a description of a vicious rout, threatening that should they choose not to surrender, the English soldiers will inflict the following war crimes. Mowing like grass, your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is to me when you yourselves are cause if your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation? Take pity of your town and of your people. If not, why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hands defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughters? Your father is taken by the silver beard and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused to break the clouds as did the wives of Jewry at Herod's bloody hunting slaughtermen. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid? Or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? The Elizabethan crowd was pretty religious back then. They probably aren't comfortable with their great conquest being compared to Herod's slaughter of the infants. He is suggesting that the town of Harfleur, in trying to save their town, would be guilty in defense. Shakespeare wants us to be uncomfortable with the hero king. Of course, there is still a certain Machiavellian logic in this, and I am certain that there were and always will be an element in the audience who, caught up in blind patriotism, will find justification for such threats. Later on, in Act 4, King Henry is moving amongst his men, disguised, offering them encouragement, but also listening to their uncensored criticism. One soldier has the audacity to suggest that the king, sending all these thousands of men into battle, may have some reckoning to make in the afterlife, when God may call him to account for all those lives lost. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make, when all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in battle shall join together at the latter day and cry all, We died at such a place! Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children rawly left. I am afeard there are few die well that die in battle. Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it. This kind of a confrontation surrounding the king's responsibility to those men that he led into battle is almost unheard of. Even asking the question in the Elizabethan era must be borderline treason. And here's what Henry has to say in response. See if it sounds 100% satisfying to you. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers the father of his son, nor the master of his servant, for they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Besides, there is no king, be his cause never so spotless, if it come to the arbitrament of swords, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore, should every soldier in the wars do as every sick man in his bed, wash every moat out of his conscience, and dying so, death is to him advantage. Or not dying, the time was blessedly lost wherein such preparation was gained. If the cause of this war is not entirely righteous, has King Henry washed himself clean of responsibility? And given those war crimes articulated already, is there such a thing as a righteous war? I would suggest that anyone with a conscience cannot help but feel a lingering doubt. And so the battle gets underway. 
King Henry has recited his famous St. Crispin's Day speech. Henry, in spite of the great numerical disadvantages, estimated five to one in the French favor, does very well in the battle. They are winning and by all rights should have won the battle. But in spite of this, Henry hears another blare of trumpets to rally the French. But hark! What new alarm is this same? The French have reinforced their scattered men. Then every soldier kill his prisoners. Give the word through. We'll cut the throats of those we have, and not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. The English took prisoners amid the battle, and the French are rallying, and so Henry gives the order to kill the prisoners, punishing the opposition for daring to attempt to win the battle. The sea of war within which Henry has been engulfed himself has sucked him down, making dreadful choices that war, by its very nature, forces upon its combatants. Once we open up the Pandora's box of going to war, there is no way of emerging with clean hands. Yes, great King Henry V comes through the conflict with inspiring words and great success, but he leaves doubt behind, perhaps presenting future ages with less intimate ties to British patriotism. Reason to second guess, to question, to wonder about those horrific acts performed amid the desperation of war. Of course, the great irony that closes out this play is the realization that it would all come to nothing. At the end of all this death and destruction, Shakespeare notes in the briefest afterthought, Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden be achieved, and of it left his son, imperial lord, Henry VI, whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed. As great as this great victory was, it didn't really matter. Shakespeare seems to be suggesting not that it is wrong once in to struggle to win, but that maybe not getting in deserves greater consideration. Perhaps by its very nature, war corrupts everything that it touches. Shakespeare continues to address this question, especially in the coming plays surrounding the War of the Roses, Henry VI, parts 1, 2, and 3, and Richard III. He depicts even more questionable choices and horrible battles as England takes on not a foreign adversary, but its own people, with father killing son, son killing father. We'll be picking up that thread in the coming weeks as we resume the story with Henry VI, part 1. So that's I Finally Get Henry V. Hopefully, this bit of background will double your ability to get what's going on in the play. My play, depicting much of this action, also featuring the popular speeches that everybody wants to hear from this play, Shakespeare's Histories, 10 Epic Plays at a Breakneck Pace, is available for booking both online and in person. As I mentioned before, we've got a new, less expensive studio version available to broadcast your school or organization. Please, swing by timmooneyrep.com for the performance schedule or to book an event for your own school, theater, or conference, in person or via the internet. I do these videos on a fairly regular basis. Hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of them. You can go back and see the first one I did on Shakespeare's histories here, which will give you even more insight into the overall arc of these amazing 10 plays. And there you'll find more videos on lots of Shakespeare stuff. We've also got a Patreon campaign if you'd like to support this work. We are a not-for-profit organization at patreon.com slash Tim Mooney Rep. We have giveaways of lots of swag, like this book on Shakespeare's histories, as well as the Breakneck Julius Caesar Companion, both of which now feature easy-to-follow color maps. And this and lots more goodies can be found at timmooneyrep.com. Thanks for watching. See you on the stage.